I'd like to start the talk just talking a little bit about what every newspaper went ballistic about this week, which is back pain and antibiotics. Now, we've got some pretty outrageous statements here from, of course, Peter Hamlin, who used to work at the LIH. Up to 40% of patients with chronic back pain can be cured with a course of antibiotics rather than surgery. My goodness, this stuff is definitely what Nobel Prizes are made of. Let's have a look over here. This is vast. We're talking about probably half of all spinal surgery for back pain being replaced by antibiotics, said Peter Hamlin, consultant surgeon at UCH. It may be that we can save 250 million pounds from the NHS budget simply by putting people on a course of... Exactly, you got it. <laughs> I genuinely believe they can get a Nobel Prize. So I wanted to have a better look at what this was all about. Again, looking at some of the figures and what we spend on surgery, um, a little bit about scientists proving what they can do, and finally, the concept of treating these conditions is revolutionary. Again, let's have a quick look at what this is about. Is this news? Well, I look back in the literature beforehand, and in fact, this all relates to a specific type of back pain associated with previous lumbar disc herniation. The study in question, the initial pilot study, was in fact carried out by the author of the big study, the new RCT study, which I'm going to talk about. His name was Hannah Albert, Southern Danish Rheumatology Group, who actually got their initial pilot study was presented in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2008. Now, this was non-randomized, and this was not controlled. But they had enough patients there to go on and design something which was a little bit better. Now, this is the one I'm referring to here, which has now been published in the European Spine Journal, which was in April 2013, so obviously very recently. And the title of it was Antibiotic Treatment in Patients with Chronic Low Back Pain and Vertebral Bone Edema, a double-blind randomized trial of efficacy. 162 patients were recruited, randomized effectively. The inclusion criteria were chronic low back pain for six months. They also had to have had a disc or disc episode prior to this. So confirmed disc, six months or more duration of back pain, and more, most importantly, modic type 1 changes on the MRI scan. They were blindly evaluated at baseline, 100 days, and then again at a year. And I think you'll be quite impressed with the results. On the left is the antibiotic group. Baseline, 100 days, and at one year. On the right, the placebo baseline group, 100 days and a year. Now, if we just look at the baseline, now the measurements that we used are the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire, a validated questionnaire that we use in, the in, in back pain in terms of function. We also looked at the incident, sorry, the um, reported back pain on a vascular scale of uh, 0 to 10. Again, leg pain, hours of back pain, and there was another score called the general improvement score. Now, if we look at baseline, placebo group, and the treatment group, they're exactly the same. In all parameters, there is no difference. But let's have a quick look at the antibiotic group with the Roland Morris. At 100 days, it's dropped by four points, four and a half. It drops by a further three and a half points down to seven. Back pain is reduced from 6.7 to five at 100 days. And then from 100 days to a year where there is no treatment, the score drops even further to 3.7. This is quite important. Leg pain similarly, 5.3, all the way down to 1.7. In terms of hours of back pain, again, the antibiotic group 448, you see the placebo group, interestingly, at baseline. Placebo group at 100 days, they did actually fall, but that's probably the placebo effect of being measured at 100 days, but then back up to 448. But in terms of hours of back pain, at, at one year, you've now down to 64. I mean, these, 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 these statements are, are, are certainly provocative and certainly something that we need to think about. Look at the general improvement score. 39% of patients who were in the antibiotic group felt that they generally improved. Less sick days off? My goodness, this is quite important stuff, isn't it? It really is indeed. So, antibiotics aside, let's get back to your map of medicine, which is what we're all about. I don't know what's going to happen with the antibiotic study, and I think it's very important that we discuss this, but I think putting people on antibiotics in itself 
is, is not wise, not unless the tight inclusion criteria are met. So we need to be very careful about this. Getting back to maps of medicine. Now, these are validated maps um, available to all of you on the internet um, via mapsofmedicine.com, mapofmedicine.com. And using an Athens username, you can normally access the map. And there are loads of things on it. I'm sorry it hasn't come out. It's a bit small, but there are all sorts of things like the management of abdominal aortic aneurysm, ankle injuries, um, all sorts of things. As you can see, I've just, my history search has just been on back pain. But that's basically how you access it. Now, if we have a look here, who put it together? For us, in terms of back pain and back pain management, it's been put on by the um, British Pain Society. And it's based upon quality assessed evidence and practice based knowledge. It was last updated in November 2012, and it continues to be updated and validated all the time. There are at least 130 validated references behind what the recommendations are, and they divide it up into simple back pain management and then more complex, and we'll go through some of the flow diagrams. And there are representatives on the panel from patients, primary care, pain medicine, rheumatology, psychology, physiotherapy, and chiropractic. So a proper spread of practitioners who would be managing back pain. Let's have a look. What it says here, and again, I do apologize, but I had to cut and paste it as it is. It says, back and leg pain, clinical presentation, history and examination. If you have a look at all of these here, where there is an eye, you can hover your cursor over, and the box will come up, providing you with the information that you need for any of these boxes. Essentially, what this does, this separates red flags out from other patients. So if you've got a red flag, i.e. cauda equina, Call an ambulance, refer to A&E, it's an emergency. Red flags on this side over investigations and management. If you pop up over the box, it will tell you which bloods to do, which tests to organize if you feel there are some red flags, and consider a differential diagnosis. So it's intuitive, it's very clever indeed. I wish I could do it online, but it's a bit difficult and beyond the scope of this. But nonetheless, if a patient passes through here, what do you do? You advise reactivation, avoid bed rest, provide appropriate pain relief, self-care management, and patient education. Again, over all the information dots, it will tell you what to do. Because I'm a pain doctor, I have to tell you about what to treat people with. Paracetamol, non-steroidals, weak opioids, and muscle relaxants. It's what we know, it's what we all do. What we shouldn't be giving patients are anticonvulsants. However, if they've got leg pain, you should. And that's all it has to say. Going further down that, pathway. What's really important here is if there is no improvement or deterioration at this point, you need to assess patients using the start back tool. Now, I work in the City and Hackney Back Pain Service and we've actually used the start back tool for some time, developed by Keele University to differentiate patients into copers and people who don't cope particularly well. Now, since the time that this was actually devised, this map of medicine, we've got three patients here. Patients who are low risk, medium risk, and high risk. What we now use is a shortened version, a six-point scale, which puts them into high risk or low risk. The low risk are patients who will take the message home. They will do home exercises. You can probably give them short courses of analgesics, give them some advice, and they will manage themselves quite well. If they score three or above on the start back, which we will come to here, we need to actually send them to physiotherapy plus or minus cognitive behavioral therapy. And what is the start back tool? Very easy. Pain is spread down my legs at some time. I've only walked a short distance because of my back pain. I've dressed more slowly. I feel my back pain is terrible and never going to get better. In general, I've not enjoyed the things I used to. Overall, how bothersome does your back pain make you feel in the last two weeks? The scores of three and above are high risk. High risk need referral in for psychosocial, essentially physiotherapy with a little bit of mind bending. That's what I call our physiotherapists are all trained to, to administer some early sort of explain pain and all sorts of early psychology which is associated with these problems. Finally, getting down to the very end of your map, map of medicine, um, this says if at 12 weeks there's been no improvement, um, referral to a specialist pain centre or spinal centre, refer to a spinal centre. And if you see, wherever you have this R on the map of medicine, it will tell you who to refer to. All right. Incredibly user-friendly. And, of course, if the patients do get better at 12 weeks, 
well, then you can consider getting them back into a supportive environment, encouraging exercise, and go on to another pathway of MAPSA medicine, which is ongoing pain management. All right, so it's all there for you to read. Very straightforward, very basic, and I hope with this you're now equipped to completely manage back care happily in primary care. Thank you very much.